It's uh, the elevated seat is actually meant for the Bhagavatam more than for the speaker. So I want to put the Bhagavatam below. That's not correct. Bhagavatam should be higher. Hmm? It is on that level, but it's still be too low. Hmm. Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 7, Chapter 5, Text 5, Translation and Commentary by His Divine Grace, Srila A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada, Founder Acharya of Iskand. Sri Prahalad Uvacha, Tatsadhu Manye Suravaya Dehinam, Sadasa Madhvigna Dhyam Asadkrahat, Hitvatma Patangri Hamandha Kupang, Tanangato Yadharim Ashrayeta. <coughs> Translation Prahalad Maharaj replied, O best of the Asuras, king of the demons, as far as I have learned from my spiritual master, any person who has accepted a temporary body and temporary household life is certainly embarrassed by anxiety because of having fallen in a dark well where there is no water but only suffering. One should give up this position and go to the forest, Vana. More clearly, one should go to Vrindavan, where only Krishna consciousness is prevalent and should thus take shelter of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, purport. Hiranyakashipu thought that Prahlad, being nothing but a small boy with no actual experience, might reply with something pleasing but nothing practical. Prahlad Maharaj, however, being an exalted devotee, had acquired all the qualities of education. Yasyasti bhaktiya bhagavat kikinchana sarvaya gunais tatra samasate suraha Harab Abhaktasya Kato Mahad Guna Manorathena Sati Dhavato Bhagi. One who has unflinching devotional faith in Krishna consistently manifests all the good qualities of Krishna and the demigods. However, he who has no devotion to the Supreme Personality of Godhead has no good qualifications because he is engaged by mental concoction in material existence, which is the external feature of the Lord. So-called educated philosophers and scientists who are simply on the mental platform cannot distinguish between what is actually sat, eternal, and what is asa, temporary. The Vedic injunction is asato ma jyotir gama. Everyone should give up the platform of temporary existence and approach the eternal platform. The soul is eternal and topics concerning the, the eternal soul are actually knowledge. Elsewhere it is said, apashyatam atmatatvangri he shugri hamedhinam those who are attached to the bodily conception of life and who thus stick to life as a grihasta or householder on the platform of material sense enjoyment cannot see the welfare of the eternal soul. Prahlad Maharaj confirmed this by saying that if one wants success in life, he should immediately understand from the right sources what his self-interest is and how he should mold his life in spiritual consciousness. One should understand himself to be part and parcel of Krishna and thus completely take shelter of his lotus feet for guaranteed spiritual success. Everyone in the material world is in the bodily conception, struggling hard for existence life after life. Prahlad Maharaj therefore recommended that to stop this material condition of repeated birth and death, one should go to the forest, Vana. In the Vanashram system, first one becomes a Brahmachari, then a Grihastha, a Vanaprastha, and finally a Sannyasi. Going to the forest means accepting Vanaprastha life, which is between Grihastha life and Sannyas. As confirmed in the Vishnu Purana, Vanashramacharavata, Vanashramacharavata, Purushena Parapuman, Vishnu Aradhate. By accepting the institution of Varna and Ashram, one can very easily elevate himself to the platform of worshipping Vishnu, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Otherwise, if one remains in the bodily conception, one must rot within this material world and his life will be a failure. Society must have divisions of Brahmana, Kshatriya, Vaishya and Shudra and for spiritual advancement one must gradually develop as a Brahmachari, Grihastha, Vanaprastha and Sannyasi. Prahlad Maharaj recommended that his father accept Vanaprastha life because as a Grihastha 
he was becoming increasingly demoniac due to bodily attachment. Prahlad recommended to his father that accepting Vanaprastha life would be better than going deeper and deeper into Grihamanga Kupam, the blind well of life as a Grihastha. In our Krishna consciousness movement, we therefore invite all the elderly persons of the world to come to Vrindavan and stay there in retired life, making advancement in spiritual consciousness, Krishna consciousness. This important verse of the Srimad Bhagavatam is spoken by Prahlad Maharaj when he was a five-year-old boy and was asked by his father, Hirani Kashipu, that what is the best thing you have learned? Hirani Kashipu, as you probably know, acquired domination over all the planetary systems by the force of his austerities compounded with the blessings of Lord Brahma. And having done that, he carried on life as a typically materialistic person. That now I got all my power, I will enjoy life. He had nothing original. He simply wanted to enjoy the same propensity as any other living being. Although he thought himself very great and very special, his propensity <coughs> was simply the same that, as that as any cat or dog or any ordinary person. He wanted to enjoy material life. So he went on doing that in the typical way, especially of the demons. He wanted to oppress others and enjoy wine, women, money, all these different things. So uh, the typical propensity that he wanted his sons to also follow in his footsteps. That tendency is there. That we like to see our children coming up to be a fine young person. Hirani Kashipu being a demon wanted his son Talad also to be a good, respectable demon worthy of the family name who could perpetuate all the activities of the demons such as enjoying wine, women, money, oppressing the demigods and all these <coughs> laudable activities in the eyes of the Asuras, the demons. So very affectionately he asked Prahlad, what have you learned at school? It's a typical thing that the parent may ask the child as an exchange of affection. However, Prahlad Maharaj wasn't interested in ordinary father-to-son dealings. Where are the books? You got them? Prahlad Maharaj was only interested in Krishna. Sometimes we hear the phrase Ajanga Bhakta. Have you heard that? Have you heard that? Ajanga Bhakta <coughs> means devotee from birth. Or Janmagata. Janmagata Vaishnava from, from his very birth. But actually Prahlad Maharaj was even before his birth. Of course birth in the English language that means when the child comes from the mother's womb. But in Sanskrit there are two terms. One is Garvasta and the other is Bhumista. So Garvasta means when the seed is placed in the womb. So that's the, that's the beginning of the birth. That's why it's said that of the two sons of Diti, of course, she had many sons, but these were the first two twins, twin sons. The first born was Hiranyaksha, and the second born was Hiranyakashipu. So who's the oldest? Hiranyaksha. No, Hiranyakashipu is the oldest. Because the semen of, who's the father? Kajapamuni. The semen of Kajapamuni, that there were two drops. So the first one became Hiranyakashipu, and that was at the. And then the next one, which came afterwards, was became Hiranyaksha. So the one which came afterwards came out first. Just like if you put all your baggage in the dicky of the car, the one you put in first comes out last. <laughs> so in this way, Hiranyakashipu was oldest. But oldest means there was only a few minutes difference. But he was oldest because he was Garvasta, the Shukra, the semen was placed in the womb first, 
So the Garbhastha and Bhumistha, when they actually come out onto the Bhumi, they become, they come out of the womb. So that's birth. But actually the, the real birth is from the time of conception, which makes sense actually. Now they have debates in the Western countries about abortion. At what age? You see, they say you shouldn't have abortion after three months or something like that because they say there's a, a child within the womb. Life has begun. But actually life begins at conception. Otherwise, if there's, if there's no life, then how is the embryo growing? So the, the, the real birth is at the time of conception. So when we say Ajanma Bhakta, actually in this case it means that Pallad Maharaj was even from within the womb. From that time, he was a devotee by the grace of who? The laws of Lord Vishnu, but how was that manifested? By the grace of Narad Muni. Just like in Hindi, where we say, His divine grace, Srila Prabhupada. So that's translated as, in Hindi. Have you seen on what they write on the books? Do you have any Hindi books? How do they write it in that in Hindi? Can you remember? Not many Hindi speakers here. Krishna Kripa Sri Murti. It means the His divine grace means the personification of Krishna's mercy. So, Narad Muni, when he said that, yes, is, how did he become Krishna conscious even within the womb? By the grace of Krishna. But how did that grace come to him? Through the via media of Narad Muni, who gave the instructions by which he could become Krishna conscious. So he, he gave those instructions and therefore he is the personified nurse. Why is it said his divine grace? Because he gives the grace of Krishna. And how does he do that? It's not simply blessing, blessing machine. Ashiva, Ashiva, Ashiva. But the mercy is by giving instructions. That's how the mercy comes. If you think, I, I'd like to get some mercy from my guru. <coughs> how are you going to get it? You have to take me in. That is the real mercy. The instruction is given. The whole purpose of the guru-disciple relationship is Divya Jnana Mito Dadya to give Divya Jnana to give transcendental knowledge and other things are there just like you very kindly conducted this Pada Puja worshipping the feet and there's so many niceties bowing down offering obeisances this is the traditional Vedic culture we don't know how long it's going to go on and it's so many things of worn down in Indian culture. Of course, this Krishna Consciousness Movement, one of the purposes is to spread Vedic culture by which Krishna Consciousness can grow, despite the strange ideas of some people within our movement who think that Krishna Consciousness has got nothing to do with Vedic culture. But actually, this is all these things. This is part of Vedic culture, to bow down before a sannyasi, to wash the feet, all these things. But these things, they don't have really very much meaning unless we are prepared to hear and take the instruction. We see there are many groups, religious groups within Hindu religion, who they do all these things very nicely. They, they receive their guru, they wash his feet, but then either they don't care for his instruction or whatever instruction he gives is better they don't care for it because it's such rubbish. So the culture may be there, but the essence of Vedic culture is stated by Krishna in Bhagavad Gita. What is that? What is the purpose of the Vedas? Who knows that? One line, very important line. Understanding. Uh -huh. What's the line in Sanskrit? Vedas chasavair aham eva vedyaha aham eva vedyo You say vedyo, but you say the next line. I made a video, Vedan, because it becomes. Otherwise, if you say around then Vedya, ha. Anyway, it's kind of one of sense. So, the whole point of the Vedic culture is to understand Krishna. Therefore, if you do all these Vedic cultural points but we don't worship Krishna, then we miss the point. It's still better to follow Vedic culture than not, but 
The real point is to understand Krishna. So, Narad Muni instructed <coughs> Prahlad Maharaj, and therefore Prahlad Maharaj was fully interested in Krishna consciousness. That, well, that's half the reason. Narad Muni instructed Prahlad Maharaj, and therefore he was fully absorbed in Krishna consciousness. That's half the reason. What's the other half? Can anyone think? Krishna's mercy already said, Narad Muni, in speaking. What's the other half? Can anyone imagine? Narad Muni spoke and Prahlad Maharaj took it seriously. That means that anyway who is a bona fide guru is going to speak bona fide topics of Krishna. But we find that there may be a bona fide guru, but not all the disciples are very bona fide. Some of them are pretty bogus. Maybe, you see. Even Prabhupada, such a great world acharya, and uh, by his personal presence, he inspired many people to take up Krishna consciousness. But we see that many they didn't continue. That means they didn't take his instructions very seriously. Maybe they thought, well, Hare Krishna is very nice, and singing, dancing, maybe some sentimental attraction or whatever. But they didn't continue to follow after Prabhupada, or even in Prabhupada's presence. Actually, on the day I was initiated, there was one devotee who had been in, living in the temple for several months, and on the, on the day of initiation, he was supposed to get initiated. No, he, he, he did get initiated. And then the next day he vanished and was never seen again. <laughs> so, even in Prabhupada's presence, many went away, and then many went away also afterwards. It means that they didn't take the instructions very seriously. So in Krishna consciousness, it's very important to have a bona fide spiritual master, but it's just as important to follow. The cycle means you have to follow. So, the Lord followed very nicely, and therefore he was fully fixed in Krishna consciousness, so much so that in a completely hostile environment, he was fully fixed in Krishna consciousness. Now, it's very important to develop Krishna consciousness. There are five things which are very important. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has recommended. Can anyone think? Say one. If you know, don't say them all. Just say one. Who can say one? What are the five items that are very important for becoming Krishna conscious? Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said. No, that's six. That's six symptoms of surrender. There are five processes of devotional service which are very important. Well, well, bhakti, I mean, we're talking about bhakti, but what are the... Within bhakti, there are so many different processes, such as... Those are nine processes of devotional service. The Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has recommended five. You don't know this, all right, I'll tell you. Sadhu Sangha, Nama Kirtan, Bhagavat Shravan, Mathura Vas, Sri Murtya, Shadhai Shivam. We recommended five things. The first is Sadhu Sangha. Second, Nama Kirtan. Third, Bhagavat Shravan. Fourth, Mathura Vas, residing in Mathura. And Shadhai Shimurtiya Sevan, to worship the deity with great faith. So, Prahlad Maharaj, these, these uh, association with devotees is very important. If it wasn't for association with devotees, none of us would be practicing Krishna consciousness now, isn't it? I mean, even if you get the books and everything without association, it's very difficult to be Krishna conscious, to keep up with the spirit. That's why we, we see it's not unusual that people who take to Krishna consciousness in great enthusiasm when they come to the Gulf, when they go back to India, oh, <laughs> they lose due to lack of association and then associating with materialistic people such as their relatives and uh, that's it they lost their enthusiasm due to lack of enthusiastic association so Prahlad Maharaj didn't have very good association he was also surrounded by <coughs> practically the most materialistic relatives you could imagine I mean we know that people have materialistic relatives, but 
probably, I don't think anyone's got relatives who are exactly in the same league as Hiranya Kashipu. Unlikely. It's not easy to be such a big demon. Here, Talad Maharaj, in this verse, addresses Hiranya Kashipu as Asurya Bharya, the best of the demons. Biggest demon. So, it's, it's not... It took a lot of endeavor to become the best of the demons. So, Prahlad Maharaj, he didn't have good association. Sadhu Sangha, Nama Kirtan, he couldn't openly do Nam Kirtan. Bhagavad Shravan, he heard when he was in the womb, but after that he didn't get any more opportunity to hear. He didn't get any more opportunity to associate with Narad Muni or other exalted Vaishnavas. Mathura Vas, he wasn't living in Mathura. He was living in the in the palace of the demons. And Shraddhai, Shimurti Sevam, he had no opportunity to worship the demons. Yet despite all this, he was completely fixed in Krishna consciousness. Therefore, elsewhere in the Bhagavatam, Narad Muni, his own guru, describes him as Maha Bhagavata or Maha. Even among Maha Bhagavats, he was very great. To be a Bhagavat, that's not an ordinary thing. To be a devotee, to be recognized as a devotee of Krishna. To be a Maha Bhagavat, that is very special. But then to be a Maha Bhagavat Maha, very few devotees can be considered like that. Highly elevated devotee, Allah Maharaj. So much so that even though he was in the body of a five-year-old boy, his consciousness was not like that at all. Generally, at the time of birth, the consciousness becomes lost. Forgetfulness takes <coughs> place. In Gita, there's that, we just quoted that line, What's the line before that in that verse? Mata smriti jnanam apohanancha. From me, Krishna says, Mataha, from me. Mata smriti, smritihi, memory. Jnanam, knowledge. And apohanam, what does that mean? Forgetfulness. These things come from me. So, everything is going on under the direction of Krishna in everyone's heart as the super soul. He is upadrashtanumanta cha. As the super soul, he sees everything. And he makes the arrangement by which different things can go on in this material world. Now, in the Bhagavatam, it's described that after seven months in the womb, the soul within the womb, his consciousness awakens so much so that he can remember previous births. And those who are very pious, they pray to Krishna that, Krishna, I forgot you. Please help me to remember you in this life. But then by the, at the time of birth, it's very painful for the mother, it's very painful for the child also. That's why it said, the former miseries are birth, death, old age and disease. The, the birth itself and being in the womb is also a very difficult situation. One is conscious, he's in consciousness, but he's packed up inside the womb, and different germs are there, and especially if the mother eats chilies or smokes cigarettes or drinks alcohol or eats meat that produces so much acid in the stomach. So the child is burned and scalded, a very painful situation. So the, the child is praying like that, but then he loses consciousness. But Prahlad Maharaj, by the grace of Krishna, didn't lose his consciousness of Krishna. He remembered so that he didn't become like a, a normal, foolish child. Generally, from my children, but generally children are considered foolish because children are like animals in the sense that they're uncontrolled and they don't know what... They, even an animal can be trained, but a young child, especially a young baby, they, they have no idea. They, a newborn baby can't recognize anything. They, they just pass stool without any control. Today one lady brought me her 13-year-old daughter to brought the 13-year-old daughter to see me who was mentally retarded and, and hyperactive. It's a difficult combination for the mother because she just, just like a young baby grabbing things, putting in the mouth, kicking this and that. 
So a young child who is not trained is uh, just like an animal, unintelligent. But Prahlad Maharaj wasn't like that. <coughs> Prahlad Maharaj kept his consciousness of this very elevated philosophy so that when Hiranyakashipu asked him, what have you learned? He thought he might have learned that one plus one equals two, ka, ka, ga, ga, something like this. But what did Prahlad Maharaj say? What did he say? That what philosophy is speaking? Any person who has accepted a temporary body and temporary household life is certainly embarrassed by anxiety because of having fallen in a dark well where there is no water but only suffering. Ah, what? I mean, even uh, you'll find big, big philosophers, they're not speaking such things. What to speak of a five-year-old boy? Five-year-old boy, what does he know about family life being full of suffering and anxiety? He doesn't have experience. But he's learned by hearing from his spiritual master. He says, uh, I, think it, I think this is very good. You ask me what I thought is the best thing I learned. I think this is good. Asurya Bhariya. Oh, King of the demons, O oh best of the demons. Dehinam, those who have accepted material bodies, Sada Samadvigna Dhyā, their intelligence is always harassed by so many different anxieties. Full of anxiety. This is the material, in material life, everyone is full of anxieties. From Brahma down to the little worm. Everyone is full of anxiety. The worm is anxious when the bird will come and get me. The bird, have you seen the bird? Of course you won't see in Dubai because there's no, there's no such thing as soil or worms living in there. But the, the worm, the bird, is going and finding the worm on the ground and is pulling out of the hole. Have you seen that? How they pull the worm out of the hole? They find the worm in the ground and they pull up. But even while they're taking it up, they're looking here and there that some other animal won't come to get me. Always full of anxiety. Simply full of anxiety. So this is the material position. Sada samuddhigna dhyo asadgraha Because they have accepted that which is temporary to be real. We ac Because we think that I am the body, just because of that we are full of anxiety. At the very least the anxiety is there that I have to die. In the back of everyone's mind there is always this anxiety. And so many other anxieties. We're afraid, what will others think of me? This is very much exacerbated by the modern society in which they promote the bodily concept of life more and more. That it's it's very important how you dress, what you look like. If you're a man, your body should be a lot of muscles and very strong. If you're a woman, you shouldn't you have to see how much makeup and lipstick and so many things. And so much attention is given to the body. Hairstyle. When I first came to India, there was no such thing as hairstyle. It was just simply the men, their, their hair was like this. And they cut it every so often. Yeah, even that's westernization, otherwise traditional they should be shika. Or otherwise long hair and tied up. And for the women there was simply this shimanta, the parting and tied with one braid, choti. And then now they've invented so many. Not invented, not invented. They've aped the West with so many things so many hairstyles and so many passions. Lipstick, makeup, so many things. Something for the lips, powder and cream for the face, for the eyelashes, for the eyebrows. So many perfumes, aftershave, so many different things. But the result is that you're always in anxiety. What will someone think of me? Will they think I'm looking very beautiful? Or maybe not? Because, factually speaking, I mean, in the heavenly planets it's said that 
all the women are very beautiful, but by the laws of nature on this planet, either men or women, only a few have got very good looks, and the rest are ordinary or less than ordinary or just plain out and out ugly. So that means that most of the population is simply full of anxiety. I've seen in the, when I was a kid at school that everyone is full of anxiety. What, what others are thinking of me and how I'm dressed every moment, how I'm walking, how I'm talking. The boys are thinking, what are the girls thinking of me? And the girls are thinking, what are the boys thinking of me? Simply full of anxiety. This is the material concept. And because of that anxiety, we think, I have to have a Mercedes car, just to show, you see. I have to have a good position. I have to send my children to study in America. All these different things. You see all the workers here coming from Bangladesh, Thailand, here they're just treated like dirt. Oh, Bangladesh. <laughs> when they go back to their village, then they're very big shot come from the Emirates, come from Abu Dhabi. You see, oh, very big shot, very prestigious. So everyone is concerned with prestige. Here, Bangladeshi considered, oh, not very prestigious, but then when they go back, oh. And everyone is thinking, America, Britain, very high class, very prestigious. You see, anyone, any normal person in Britain, no one cares for them at all in Britain. But when they come here, oh, British, oh, <laughs> British, oh, very important person, because they're thinking this is something very important, all oh, prestige, but actually it's simply a cause, all this bodily concept of life, it's simply a cause of anxiety, just like even if a woman is very beautiful, it's not going to last, after some time, for some years they can enjoy, if there's such propensity, they can enjoy wrapping men around their little finger. That's the same thing. But then after some time, the lines come, the face sag, and they're no longer beautiful. So full of anxiety, always full of anxiety. This is material life. And even if we, we're not so much on this ridiculous bodily concept of life, we're just normal people, looking after a family. But it's a very difficult job to look after a family in the modern age. You see, mostly people here in the Gulf. In the Gulf, in India also, this modern way of life, people are working so long hours. <coughs> hard work. Long hours, hard work. And another anxiety, they can be fired from their job anytime. Or even if they're doing any their business, the business may fail may go down, because most of the business is they're just, it, it's just all nonsense business. I mean, if you're doing a business, just selling cloth, just regular clothes that people need, or, or uh, selling fruit, or selling, selling grains, then it's a standard business. It's always going to be there. Of course, selling fashions, that, that's not such a, if the economy is down, then the fashion business is down. But regular cloth, that people need, like goatees or kurtas or something like that. There'll always be a business. But when you're doing business in, in things which are not essential, even if it's industrial components or such things, when, when the economy goes down, then it all goes down. So you're always full of anxiety. Or even if you're selling something which is whatever it may be, but there's always competition, someone may knock you out. So always anxiety. This is material life. Therefore, Talad Maharaj, in one verse, he is given practically one line. Dhyanam sadasamud vigna dhyama sabgrahat. Everyone in this, everyone who's in the bodily concept of life, is full of anxiety because of having accepted that which is asa, that which is temporary or unreal, as something of sub, of substance. There's no substance in the body. Substance means whatever it is, it's temporary. It's not real. Na tato vidyate bhavo, na bhava vidyate sata. In Gita, Krishna gives the very simple advice, which most people 
it's a very obvious thing but most people don't consider it or don't understand it at all that that which is temporary will not last and that which is eternal will always last it will never be destroyed in other words the soul will continue to exist but the body definitely will not continue to exist very basic point which most people never even think about they're too busy they're too much absorbed on the platform of asa they that narottam das thakur has sung that aham kare mat to haya nitai pada pasariya asatya re satya kari mane that due to ahanka identifying the body as the self people become insane they forget krishna they forget nityananda and therefore they accept that which is unreal to be real and therefore people they they take much so much interest in things which have no importance such as cricket matches very important who will win this match it's not important it doesn't mean anything but it's been from those who are on the platform of asa they are promoted very important cricket match be the next president of america who's taking it's this it's automatic no, okay. who will be the next president of america as if it makes any difference just make it. now they're going they're gearing up for the elections what does it matter so just in a few words he has summed up the whole material situation and he's giving a radical suggestion not even suggestion he's practically telling his father five year old boys they're not supposed to tell their fathers we're talking about culture so one point of culture which many parents are lamenting nowadays is that the children they don't like to listen to their parents which isn't surprising because if you bring them up with the western culture and education then you're going to get the same thing the, the part of western culture is that no one listens to anyone it's it's all equal it's all democratic i mean no one cares for anybody the children don't care for their parents the wives don't care for their husband it's all just all everything's the same that's why in western culture they don't like the idea that there should be gurus and disciples why everyone should everyone should just say whatever he likes do whatever he likes so in one sense it seems that pralad maharaj he was not following the culture because he was instructing his father but he was doing so because actually he was in a superior position even though his age was younger and his social position was younger but from the spiritual platform he was in a superior position that's why at least previously in india people used to say that oh you see you westerners you can't be hindus you can't be brahmins you can't be sanyasis you can't be gurus they used to say they thought that well you have to be born as a hindu then you can do this but that's a misunderstanding or they would say that well i'm a born hindu so i know about krishna you don't have to tell me although actually they don't know anything but they were thinking that you see westerner means lecha although themselves they're lecha because the the definition of lecha is not simply they they gave the idea lecha means someone who's born outside india but actually the lecha means meat eater or one who doesn't follow the vedic principles so they themselves are not following they're simply thinking i'm following but they're not following so although from the social point of view it is surprising that westerners are instructing hindus in vedic knowledge from the perspective of spiritual reality no one's a westerner no one's a hindu spiritual knowledge is to be imparted by those who have it to have it and received by those who don't have it so pralad maharaj from the spiritual platform is instructing his father we find in the past times of chaitanya mahaprabhu that there was mukunda datta and vasudev datta who were brothers now vasudev was older 
But Chaitanya Mahaprabhu once asked Vasudeva, but who is older, you or Mukunda? Which is a strange question when he'd known them for, since childhood. Who is older? Vasudeva said, Mukunda is older because he came to Krishna consciousness first. So I consider him, he's superior to me. So Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said, yes, that's the right answer. So on the spiritual platform, we have to see... I mean, there are also social considerations. If one is older, some respect should be given within Vaishnava society also. All these things are there. But really we have to see who is spiritually elevated. Just like the same thing, Shukadeva Goswami entered the assembly where Parikshit Maharaj was sitting. Parikshit Ma- Shukadeva was just a young boy. But everyone sat to listen. They, they bowed down and listened to Shukadeva. Even his own father, who had instructed him, was willing to listen because Shukadev Goswami had some realization. Shukamakad Amrita Drana Sangyatam, the Srimad Bhagavatam became more relishable having been explained by Shukadev Goswami. So, its spiritual culture doesn't necessarily um, sing, it's not necessarily synchronatic with material culture, although the, the basic Varnashram culture is meant for supporting spiritual culture. But ultimately the spiritual culture is on a higher platform or different platform. Therefore Krishna, he says, Savadhanan Parityajama Mekam Shanan Raja that the Varnashram system is given by Krishna, Charter Varnyang Maya Srishtam. I have given this system of four Varnas, Krishna says. But ultimately Krishna says to go above and beyond that and surrender to me only. At the same time, his real instruction to Arjuna is to surrender to him, but at the same time he told Arjuna, you fight. Why to fight? Well, there are Varnashram considerations, as a Kshatriya he should fight, but the main reason he should fight, over and above Varnashram considerations, is because Krishna wants him to. If Krishna didn't want him to, then even if it was his Kshatriya duty to do so, he should not have done so. If Krishna had wanted Arjuna to go to the forest, just like Prahlad Maharaj is saying here, Vanangato yadhare maashreta, go to the forest, he's advising Hiranyaka Shibu, and take shelter of Hari. If Arjuna had said, if Krishna had said such a thing to Arjuna, he should have done it, even against the Varnashram principles. But because Krishna wanted him to follow that, then that was Bhakti Yoga. That was the highest platform. So Varnashram and Bhakti Yoga are in many ways syncretic, but not necessarily so. Therefore, even the Varnashram duties, may be, it may be that one has to give them up. Of course, no one's even following them, so where's the question of giving them up in the modern age? But, uh, or what material duties, they may be given up. Of course, this requires proper understanding. Here we see that Prahlad Maharaj is telling Hiranyakashipu, Hidvatna patangri hamanda kupam. He's telling Hiranyakashipu, give up the soul-destroying blind well of family life. Go to the forest and take shelter of Hari. So he may think, oh, Bhakti Vikas Swami came and said we should give up family life. Actually, you should. (laughs) But, yes, really, seriously, everyone should. But, but, there is a but also. There's a point of family responsibility also. So, even though you should, you should, you have to wait until the family duty is fulfilled. Of course, the materialistic people, they'll never consider their family duty to be fulfilled. And therefore, they'll remain in the blind well of family life forever, birth after birth. But, uh, that is given, Panchas or Dvangvanang Rajat, having come to the age of 50, that means one's children should be grown up, at least the eldest son. Grown up, trained up, and then Vanaprastala. So that system is there. Of course, even in youth, if one really has a strong, strong sense of renunciation, he may do so, but then you have to consider that children are there better to cultivate renunciation along with the family duties. So, um, 
Prahlad Maharaj is giving instruction here that give, give this up, get out. You're in Maya. He's telling his father, you're in Maya. You're in illusion. You should be Krishna conscious. Children can also do that. I mean, if your children are Krishna conscious and their parents are not, they can always say, it's not that Krishna conscious always is the main or is the is the main consideration. That's why we, we, we hear that the husband is supposed to be the guru to the wife, but sometimes it's round the other way. Actually, many times. That the wife is telling the husband that, come on, chant Hare Krishna, get out of Maya, like this. So, whoever's got Krishna conscious can say to others, of course, Prahlad Maharaj is very bold. He was an innocent five-year-old boy. He didn't think what is the proper etiquette or any such thing. He directly told what is the situation. That Grihamanga Kupam is a blind well. Blind well means just like in a field, sometimes there is a, a, an overgrown well. The, the well is not, it's not very big, but it's been abandoned and the grass has grown, the long grass has grown, so you can't see it. And you may be walking in the field and you'll fall down. And there's no water. Why is it abandoned? Because there's no water. So you simply fall and break your head. So this uh, materialistic family life is compared to that. Of course, family life in Krishna consciousness, that is wanted. But at the same time, we should consider that the tendency in family life is to increase the bodily concept. Therefore, Grihastas and Krishna Gondras should be very careful that their family life is actually Krishna, Krishna conscious and Krishna centered. Because by the very nature of family life, there are so many bodily considerations. Looking after children requires a lot of, especially when they're very young, there's a lot of bodily, looking after the body. And uh, then the family duty to see that the children are educated. Of course, modern education, Prabhupada, as he, he analyzed very properly, that it's just slaughterhouse education. That this, why slaughterhouse? Because even though the children may get an education by which they may become a doctor, an engineer, or whatever, the uh, spiritual inclination in modern education is completely killed. Generally, children, they can take to Krishna consciousness very easily. Any children all over the world, mostly, they're very innocent and can be easily molded. But they, we see that practically preaching in the schools, anywhere, in India especially, that the young children, we can bring them in and teach them Bhagavad Gita and they pick it up very nicely and often their questions are better than the older people. The older people, will, their parents will come in and say, what's that yellow paint on your nose? And the children will be asking questions very intelligently maybe six, seven years old children. They'll hear a little bit from Bhagavad Gita and they'll ask very intelligent philosophical questions. Usually better than me. But we see as they get older, especially after they they go to college, then they become, often they, mostly they become very much spoiled. Although sometimes it, it happens that they're so frustrated with the whole situation. Now we're seeing this whole generation of students in India, they're very frustrated because they're under so much pre they're under so much pressure to, from their parents to get a high degree. And but in front, they can see in front of them that they're working like anything to get their degree. And what's the result? They'll get a so-called good job, which means they'll just have to work all their life with a, under heavy pressure, a lot of tension. So they feel very frustrated on that side. On the other side, there's so much propaganda to enjoy, 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 and they want to do that, but then on the other hand, they're under pressure to succeed in their studies. And, and this, this pressure to enjoy material life, go to parties and wear fashions, and it's simply a cause of frustration because even if, 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 you, if you do that, if you go to parties and you wear all the fashions, you find that it doesn't bring happiness, so you're frustrated. And if you don't have it, then you're also frustrated because you're thinking, I wish I had it. Prabhupada used to say one, 
uh, Hindi saying. It's a little bit slang, but Prabhupada said it, so I'll say it. Dele ka ladu jo kaya wo pista Jo na kaya wo bhi pista Dele ka ladu. Can you understand what that means? It's not slang language. Something very sweet in Delhi, the people call it. means a prostitute. It, it doesn't mean actually a ladu. It's, a, it's slang, it means a prostitute. So those who have tasted, they are lamenting. Maybe they got AIDS. Or they, they're lamenting, there are two kinds of lamenting. Either it wasn't as good as you thought it would be. Or you're hankering that, well, I had it, but now I don't have any money and now I have to go again. I, I wish I, you can't get it all the time. You can't always get one. If you're thinking it's something very nice, you can't get it all the time. Or if you, even if you do get it, then you get AIDS and so many diseases. So anyway, it's simply a cause of suffering. And those who didn't have, they're thinking, oh, I wish I had. So either way, material enjoyment, either you get it or you don't get it, you're simply suffering. So in the modern age, I see the students, especially in India, they're, they're under a lot of bombardment. But you have to have designer jeans, designer sunglasses, designer t-shirts, designer shoes, so on. You have to speak with an American accent, which you learn from the TV. You're under so much pressure. You have to look cool. So you're under so much pressure, and it simply causes so much pressure to enjoy, to cut an image. But they're simply frustrated. So this is material life. The more we have consciousness of sense gratification, the more we suffer. So family life, that's there. It's, it's got to be there to some extent. The, the, the bodily concept and looking after the children, so many things, which we're not saying don't do that because every, those who are in family life, they have a responsibility to do that. But it should be done in Krishna consciousness. Um, that means we should see how the children are brought up to know Krishna, the parent's duty is to give food, shelter, clothing, education, health care. But over and above, what's the most important thing? To give knowledge of Krishna. Otherwise, what's the use? Even the uh, animals, they have children. And they're looking after them to the best of their ability. So without giving Krishna consciousness, it's uh, simply animalistic life. So Krishna conscious family life means... Krishna in the center, not a little bit away from the center or a little bit to the side, but very much in the center, in everything we do. But still, there's, some, there's always some tendency towards, there's, naturally there's some attachment on the bodily platform, that, that there may be so many women walking the street, that particular one we're feeling, oh, this is my wife. Although actually as jivas, we have no, as jivas we're all intimately connected with, together, with the relationship with Krishna. But there's no particular reason that we should be connected to any other body, but somehow we become joined together. Just like uh, on an airline, so many people may come together and get in the plane. So you may be sitting next to someone and you may adjust this way, both of you are trying to put your hand on the resting couch. And you may talk where you're from, this, that and the other. But it's, it's, only, it's only, what, two hours or four hours and enough. You may not even talk to them because you're just, you just happen to be put together by the fact that you're going on a plane. And then you'll get down and you'll go and do whatever you're doing. So in the same way, in the course of time, People come together as husband, wife, children, all these things. And in course of time, they separate again and they go somewhere else. Another example that there may be little twigs in the river and in a big river, in the Ganga, in the rainy season, so many pieces of wood will be washed up. They'll come together and then they'll... they'll some big wave and then they'll all part again and then they'll, they'll scatter and they'll, with other pieces of twigs they'll all come together and form different groups. So in the same way we come together and we, we come together we think this is my wife, this is my child, this is my father. 
This is my community. I am an Indian. I'm a Gujarati. I'm a Hindu. Whatever it may be. But it's all temporary. So, that attachment which is there, it's not unnatural. But at the same time, considering everything philosophically, it's not real. It's not our real position. Therefore, cultivating Krishna conscious, vairagya vidya, knowledge, and renunciation of knowledge, we should uh, perform our duties in Krishna conscious and enjoy chanting Hare Krishna together with family members being Krishna conscious. But at the same time, remembering that. Um, a real relationship is with Krishna and whatever relationship we have is meaningful only in as much as we have Krishna firmly in the center. So even that, the tendency is there. There's always some tendency towards material attachment. Therefore, in the Vedic culture, that is recommended oh, that at a certain point in time, even someone who's very pious, they should become detached from family life. Of course, Pallad Maharaj is saying this as a five-year-old boy. Later on, he also got married. He was a Grihastha. It's his, uh, his well known that his famous grandson was also a great Mahajan, a great devotee, Bali Maharaj. So he was actually, Nrushinga Dev later instructed Pallad Maharaj to take over as the king <coughs> of the Daityas, the king of the demons from his father, after his father was killed. So to be a king, the, the kings aren't brahmachari, then they should be married, there has to be Raja and Rani. So he was married, but at the same time he understood this philosophy. That family life shouldn't be... Uh, uh, Prabhupada sometimes said that, he, he wrote in one letter, he wrote to one disciple, that, that, all right, you're getting married, but don't have a black hole disaster. In other words, don't, don't forget your real goal of life. Because the tendency is there that there's so much pressure in the work and then looking after the children. It takes all the time, practically. That's modern life, especially. But we have to have time for hearing and chanting about Krishna and remembering that, all right, my life is such that I'm in this situation, but my real purpose of life is to understand Krishna. So if Krishna is in the center, then family life is acceptable. Otherwise, black hole disaster, Rihananda Kupam, blind well, in which if one falls in the field, then how is he going to come up? There's no one to help. He's falling in a very serious position. So Pallad Maharaj is giving this reply, shocking Hiranyakashipu. He had no idea that this disaster, what he considered a disaster, had happened to him, that his son had become a Vaishnava. Actually, it wasn't a disaster. It was a great benefit for him. He was ultimately saved by his son, by his son's devotional service. He was saved from repeated birth and death. That was his great good luck. But because he is, as a demon, his consciousness was opposite. So he was thinking very bad. The lad has become a devotee. Prahlad. The name was given Prahlad. What does Prahlad mean? Does it, can anyone understand? Can they say what that name means? Ahlad means happiness. So Prahlad means greatly happy. So Hiranyakashipu had given this name. He was thinking he would be greatly happy by enjoying life like me as a demon. He doesn't have to do big austerities like I did. He, he can just enjoy the result of my austerities. But how is Prahlad happy? Not because he has got opportunity for material enjoyment, but because Nrsimha Dev is Prahlad Ahlad Dayane. He's the giver of pleasure. He is enjoying life on the platform of Krishna consciousness. In this way he's always happy. Hare Krishna. I'll finish there. And if there are any questions, you will kindly ask. Let's have questions, at least first of all, connected to the class. 
so we can keep focused on the topic, on the topics. Just see if anyone has a question. No, I'll say that. We're not going to stay all night. Excuse me. Hmm. 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 I saw you there in Vrindavan, just at the Tulsi Arti, but I didn't see you afterwards. You must maybe you went out for Parikrama or something afterwards? No, no, I returned from office at 9 o'clock. No, no, I'm saying in Vrindavan. I saw yeah. In the, uh, in the Tulsi Arti, I just Immediately after Tulsi Arti, we left for Delhi. I see. So it was nice to come back from Delhi. You just, uh, you just came to Vrindavan for one day, the day before, yeah, was yeah. it? Because I I left before the kirtan finished. And then yeah, after Tulsi Arti, I was trying to locate you, but I couldn't locate you, and you were in Hari. I, I had to rush off also. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah. So what's the question anyway? Yeah. We're after the social niceties. What are the spiritual realities we have to discuss? I, I, I'd like to take first of all any questions which relate to topics in the class. Is this related? It's not related. Okay, so let, let's see if there are any... Are there any questions, first of all, related to the topics in the class? Because then we can keep one train of thought and then afterwards we can go off anywhere else. Any questions like that? No, okay, all right. So Krishna says, I spoke to Vivaswan. No, he didn't say that at the beginning of this age. Just he spoke to Vivaswan a long time ago, no doubt. Uh, but uh, we understand that Brahma is the first one to receive the knowledge. Mm-hmm. So how come well, there are different... There are four... Yesterday, the whole class, I was discussing about four paramparas in which Krishna spoke to... Who can say? Who are the four people that Krishna spoke to? Brahma, you're saying Brahma as well. Rudra, Lakshmi, and the four commands. Yeah. But... Uh, <coughs> These, these are the four from whom the Sampradayas have come. It doesn't mean that Krishna doesn't speak to others. Krishna, Krishna also spoke to Arjuna. Krishna also spoke to Vivasvan. But, they, they, but they, the Sampradaya didn't come from them. He spoke to them individually. Even Krishna himself comes within the Sampradaya. He comes as Chaitanya Mahaprabhu within his own sampradaya. <coughs> so it's not necessarily that when Krishna speaks to everyone that uh, that means that, they, that the whole sampradaya develops from that. We find in, in Bhagavatam Krishna spoke so many things to Uddhava who was then supposed to give that knowledge to the uh, sages at Padrik Ashram. So I guess that, that could be called sampradaya, but not well. That, that's parampara, but then, but no sampradaya developed from that. They're very similar. Yeah. They're very similar. There are many words. Karuna. Anukampa, Kripa, Daya, Prasad, they're all very similar words. Probably if we analyze in Sanskrit, we may find some marginal. I believe Kripa and Daya. I can't remember. One means, if, if you examine, just like if you say Stri, Patni, it means the same thing. But there may be some, actually Stri means Jo Vistakarte. They make everything, they expand from one from the family, then the family expands from the wife. So, uh, but in common usage it comes to the same thing. So, Kripa and Doya, one may, if you analyze deeply the meaning, you'll find that means that one means mercy that is given by asking and another means unasked for. So, there may be, there may be fine meanings. Audarya is not exact. You see, in, when it gets translated into English, it doesn't. In English is not a language meant for all these fine philosophical points. English is meant for eating, sleeping, mating, defending, colonizing, and all these kind of things. English is that's why many things you can't express in English anyway. Audarya that means 
It comes from the word uda. That's not exactly the same as karuna. It means liberality, magnanimity. Prabhupada has translated that. So there may be, there may be uh, slight differences in the meaning, but even if you say the, the same thing in a different way, that's also that's another that, that's also uh, poetry. <coughs> Just like Krishna has so many names, Padmanetra, Ambujaksha. There are so many names meaning lotus eye. Now, Ambujaksha means that. Uh, Aksha means eyes. So the nature also means eyes. Just like Stri, Patni, there's a different derivation. But in practical usage, if you an Ambuja means born from water, then or if you say Pankaja Netra means born born from mud. But in practical usage, it means the same thing. Come up. So if you say Ambujaksha or Pankaja Netra, it means the same thing. But it's a different poetic expression. That's because it's nice to glorify Krishna in so many ways. And we'll find in poetry that's very nice. If you have to glorify Krishna, then you'll find there are so many rules of Sanskrit grammar. So there comes alliteration. Uh, in a, you can use different words to explain the same thing. So in poetry, it comes... It, 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 a certain word will fit very nicely in a certain verse. So it sounds very nice. So... Then I have some other questions. Any other? Yeah, but you would like to take that question first. What's that? Yeah, all right. That's it. Elsewhere it is mentioned that if you chant the Harinam jokingly, with or without concentration, the effect is the same. One of the ten offenses is chanting inattentively as an offense. So this appears to be contradictory. Well, no, that's described Nama Bhas. There's uh, what is that? Uh, Hila means to to chant neglectfully. That means without any proper attention. Hila, Stobha, Sanket, and Parihas. Yeah, these four things. So you may chant. You may chant neglectfully, joking to indicate something else, or. Um, Without, yeah, with, 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 ne neglectfully, it means uh, without any concentration. So this is Nama Bas. This means for those who don't have knowledge, just like uh, all over the world, that Narasimha Rao was prime minister. So the people were discussing about Narasimha Rao. But they were saying the name Narasimha. They had no idea this is the name of God. But still they get benefit. That it's, it's, or to indicate something else. Just like... Uh, Sometimes you may say there's one uh, Krishna Paksha, we say, the, the dark fortnight, to indicate the dark fortnight. So the word Krishna is said. It's not meaning the name of Krishna, but if one says even without thinking, or, or, or even a Muslim is saying, I'm going now, I will go to Krishna Naga. So the name is there and the, the effect is there, but they don't have any idea that this is supposed to indicate Krishna. So without knowledge, if one chants like that, you have the effect of Nama Bhas. That doesn't give love of Krishna. But it can give liberation and it gives some Agyata Sukriti, some unknown benefit by which love of Krishna can... The, the propensity to begin to love Krishna can awaken. However, if one wants to chant offenselessly, then he has to chant the name of Krishna with love which is different from chanting just to say, I'm going to Krishna Naga. So you get the effect of chanting Krishna's name, but you don't get the effect of chanting Krishna's name in love of a devotee. So the point is being made here, that you get benefit from chanting like that. But then if you're very sick, if you actually want to get love of Krishna, then we, it's not that just uh, someone's saying, well, that, that Narasimha Rao, you don't get love of Krishna just by saying Narasimha Rao. You do get benefit. But you don't get love of Krishna. To get love of Krishna, you have to chant offenselessly under the guidance of a spiritual master, which requires training. So that is the difference. Very different the, hmm? This is in uh, Bhagavatam. This Hela Stoba Sanket Parihasya. This is in connection with the story of Ajamya. This is mentioned. And the analysis of that is given in the 
in the uh, writings of Rupa Goswami, you'll find in the Act of Devotion. Sanketya Hatharihasimba, Stobam Hedanamitra. By Kunta Nama Gahanam. Asheshaga, what is that? Uh, uh, Asheshaga, Harang Vidhu. The learned people say that even by this, even by neglectfully or to indicate something else or in joke or, or, or uh, as a name, if you say, that that can take away unlimited sins. That is the opinion of learned people. But you don't, you don't get love of Krishna. It doesn't say you get love of Krishna by chanting like that. I that there are two types of concentrations of shastra, two types of shastra. Mm. One is the apara vichara. Mm. One is the tattva vichara. Mm. So what is the difference? I need to think that apara vichara means... Uh, that means... Uh, that means materialistic people just like the Nimangsakas, in which they say, shastra says that you should perform sacrifice and go to the heavenly planets. So they're, they're, they're Veda Vada Rata, they're attracted to this, to the external meaning, which is just to, that's just to make you something of a human being. But Tattva Vichar means to go very deeply and understand what is the philosophy, what's the actual message of the Vedas. What is Bhagavat Tattva Vijnana? So that means those who take uh, very lightly the Apara, I mean Apara Vidya, they're on the material platform, it means materialistic Vichar. And tattva vichar means to see what is the actual meaning, what is the tattva, what is the actual essence. Vedas, so much of the Vedas is simply Taigunya Vishaya Veda, it's simply concerned with activities in the modes of material nature. But those who are actually intelligent and philosophically inclined, they're, they're, they're described in Shastras, Kovida. That verse, viduhu, those who are learning, manishina, these words are given. Those who are actually very scrutinizingly, they're, they're, not, they're not considered with the external consideration, but what is the actual essence? Tatvagyana. Yajchrinvatam rasagyanam swadu swadu pade pade. Those who are concerned with the, 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 the real tattva, the ultimate tattva is the rasa. So, those who have heard that, those who have taken that up, they're relishing it at every step. Mm -hmm. One of the, the Guru is called Ashraya Vigra Bhagavan, and Krishna is called Vishaya Vigra Bhagavan. Mm -hmm. In relation to Guru, Vishaya Vigra Bhagavan, I think, is called the object of worship. But Ashray Vigarabhan, in what context Ashray Vigarabhan, Guru Yeah, he, he gives Ashray. He's also the uh, Bhakta Bhakti Rasa Patra. He's also the, the Bhakti Ras is in him. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Krishna can also be considered Ashray, in, in as much as definitely Krishna is, we have to take shelter of Krishna. But in this context, it's that Krishna is the subject of love of God, and the devotee is the the uh, patra, or the he's the receptacle. The love of God is in him. That's why Krishna himself sometimes takes the position of his devotee to understand what is the subject of love of God that my devotees are so much anxious for. Krishna sometimes takes the position of devotee. So that he can experience love of Krishna. He is the object of love of God because he is God. So to experience love of God, he has to take a different position, that of a devotee. <coughs> <coughs> 